Good morning, everyone. I'm Christine Sa. Welcome to this news briefing from the 250th National Meeting and Expo Exposition of the American Chemical Society in Boston. We're joined today by Dr. Jason Benkowski from the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory. He'll be talking to us about a glass paint he's developed that can keep things cool even in the hot sun. Dr. Benkowski. Great. Well, thank you very much. So just to give you a little bit of background about uh, our research on this project, uh, what, one of the things that we're really trying to do is uh, to really protect structures against the damaging effects of, of sunlight. And so a lot of the times with sunlight, you think about uh, UV degradation and those types of things. But one of the things that I think people forget is that the, just the heating by itself can cause a lot of damage. You think about something like corrosion, for example. If you put corrosion inhibitors in your paint, uh, in order to protect steel or aluminum, you'll be very happy if you can decrease the rate of corrosion by a factor of 10. But just imagine now if, because of direct sunlight, now if your surface raises in temperature by 30 or 40 degrees Celsius, you might increase your rate of corrosion by a factor of 16 or more just by the fact that it's hotter. And so one of the things that we're trying to do is we're trying to make sure that the temperature never really raises above ambient. So if you can do that, you've, you've really made a lot of gains. And it's not just corrosion. It's things like uh, uh, thermal expansion, which causes fatigue failure. Uh, there's aging. And there's other forms of oxidation, which themselves will go much faster at higher temperatures. So just by reflecting the sun's light and by passively radiating infrared light, you can actually do a lot of work. And, and in fact, you can even cool below ambient temperature in direct sunlight. So if it's a 80 degree day outside, for example, you might have a 76 or a 78 degree surface just by virtue of the fact that you're reflecting all the sunlight and you're radiating all your infrared light into outer space. And so one of the things that we're doing, I think that's probably new and different in this project, is that we've really stayed away from polymeric binders. Uh, usually these have a carbon-carbon backbone. And a lot of these polymeric binders, they are susceptible to UV damage. And so when you first paint them, they may actually have all the properties you need. They may be very reflective, and they may have very good infrared radiation uh, efficiency. Uh, but unfortunately, within two or three years after you paint them, the damaging effects of ultraviolet light and, and other forms of oxidation, you may go from maybe 90% reflective to 80% reflective. And if you think about that, you've basically now just doubled the amount of sunlight that you absorb. And so now that temperature rise that you, you know, were basically had under control in the beginning, now it's a big problem. So what we're doing is we're actually using silica glass as our binder. And, and with glass, there's a lot of great things about glass. It's uh, UV resistant. It's almost like painting a rock on top of your surface. It's, it's much harder, much more wear resistant than a polymer. Uh, the fact that it's already silicon oxide means that it's already oxidized. So if there's a fire, uh, it won't catch fire. And in fact, it has this really cool property that as it heats up, it actually expands into a foam. And that foam insulates the surface and actually prevents the spread of the fire. Uh, so there's that and the fact that it's really cheap. So the starting materials are potash and sand, which are two of the cheapest, most abundant materials on Earth. Uh, it's a water-based paint, so there's no volatile organics. You don't have to worry about greenhouse gases. You don't have to worry about carcinogens. And for disposal, uh, a lot of people don't forget about the last part of that. So at the end of every paint's life cycle, you have to dispose it somehow. So you sandblast it, and then all those products, uh, you know, BPA, uh, all, all isocyanates, all these different types of chemicals, are very difficult to dispose, and you don't want them in the air. In our case, when you sandblast our surface, you're left with sand. So um, that pretty much sums up uh, the summary of the project. So if you have any questions, uh, I'd like to take them. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Binkowski. Um, we'll open it up for questions. And if you could just wait for the microphone, if anyone has any questions, just raise your hand and um, state your name and affiliation, please. Thank you. Kath O'Driscoll from Chemistry and Industry magazine. I was intrigued by this ability for it to reduce the temperature below ambient temperature. Could you explain how that happens and by how much it could reduce it below ambient temperature? Yes. So, so now in our case, we don't actually get very far below ambient temperature. So we might, um, so some of the experiments that we've shown, I think, I think the outdoor temperature that day was maybe about six degrees Celsius, and then we were able to cool down to five or four. And, and that happened for about the first 25 or 30 minutes of the experiment. It really did depend on, on the cloud cover and, and, and so forth. So um, in our case, we're not trying to get subambient cooling. There are, some, there are some people who are actually trying to do this as a cooling method. So, so if you think about like refrigeration and that type of thing, so, so there are actually studies where they engineer the surfaces to be especially good at subambient cooling. For us, 
our goal, since we're funded by the Office of Naval Research, is we just want to really stay at ambient. But to tell you how that happens, though, uh, one of the things that I think people don't realize is that, you know, if you've ever seen like a, a video from an infrared camera, you see like humans look really bright, right, because we, we were radiating a lot of uh, infrared light. And so I don't think people realize actually how much energy that, that you radiate. It's actually quite a bit. And so when you uh, are at any given temperature, you're basically radiating infrared light out to space that doesn't get radiated back. So, so you passively cool yourself by giving off that infrared light. And so if you're just really, really reflective and if you don't absorb any sunlight, you can sort of see what the balance of energy is going to be. You're, you're radiating more energy than you're absorbing. And so therefore you, you'll want to cool. But the thing you have to be careful about, though, is that you're in contact with air. So the air is always going to limit how low below ambient you can get, because there's always convection and conduction to the surrounding air. So if the air temperature is 10 degrees Celsius, if you cool down to 8, that temperature, that the air is trying to warm you up. So those, those are the three factors you have to worry about. Reflect the sun, radiate infrared light, and then manage uh, the conduction to the air. So quickly ask a bit about the chemistry as well of the silicates. How is it that they are so reflective that they're able to to sort of reflect light mm -hmm. in this way. And you mentioned in, in the release, it talks about you tweaked the chemistry of the potassium silicate. Can you say anything about sure. how you did that too? So, so in order to reflect light, it's actually surprising that it's, it's much more difficult to make a white paint than it is to make a black paint. So when you make a white paint, what you're basically doing is you're, it's, it's what is called multiple scattering. So you have uh, a pigment, which is like zinc oxide or titanium dioxide. And it turns out that those materials are actually transparent. Everything in your system is transparent. So your, your binder, which is glass, is transparent. And the things you're adding to it are transparent. But what happens, though, is that the refractive index is a little bit different for the two materials. And so when light interacts at those interfaces, it scatters. So it bounces down, left, right, up, down. So eventually it scatters so many times it comes back out of the paint back towards the source. And so. The, the technology that we're doing there is very similar to what others do for, for making white paint. And, and so, but what we're doing that's, I think, a little bit different is we're paying very close attention to all of the sun's energy. Because for a white paint, mostly what you're worried about is the visible appearance to the naked eye. So then you only really care about the wavelengths between you know, 300 and 700 nanometers, because that's what your eye can see. But about 5% of the sun's energy is in the ultraviolet and about 55% of the sun's energy is in the near infrared. So these are the wavelengths from 700 nanometers out to three microns. Your eye can't see them, but that's more than half of the sun's energy. And so most paints don't bother with this part. And so what we're doing is by reflecting all three of those, that's how we're actually able to get such a high uh, reflectivity, and that's why our temperature doesn't rise as much. And then that actually allows you to go one step further, so you can actually make a paint that's visibly dark so long as you only absorb visible. So if you just try to absorb between that 700 and, and 300 nanometer wave band, you can actually take that penalty, but because you're reflecting all that near infrared, it's not so bad, and you can actually still maintain a fairly low temperature. Useful energy? Could you apply that with a solar collector type of device? Yes, well, okay. solar collectors do use the near infrared, yes. So if you have something that's like a mirrored surface, like a, a silvered or, or, or an aluminized surface, you'll reflect all of those different wavelengths. You'll get UV, visible, and near infrared. So that's, that's basically every wavelength below three microns, you know, you'll be able to reflect all of the sunlight. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. all right, do we have any other questions? Ben. Ben Valsler from Chemistry World. Um, I'm intrigued by the fact that you are developing a soluble water-based paint that then becomes insoluble once it's painted. What is the transition there, and do you know how long it remains insoluble for? Yeah, so well, th thanks for asking. So uh, yeah, th th to the last part of the question, uh, we actually put these in boiling water and they don't dissolve. So, and it's an especially big challenge for us because we have a, a strict requirement that we have to dry these paints at room temperature. And so for exactly the reason that you, you mentioned, you know, you're starting from something that's water soluble, why shouldn't it just be reversible and then redissolve? Uh, so the material itself is called potassium silicate. And so if you take potassium and you mix it with uh, silica, if you add enough of potassium, it eventually becomes water soluble. Because if you think about windows, uh, windows that's actually sodium silicate. But if you only have a little bit of sodium, it's not water soluble. You just go a little bit further, it becomes water soluble. So we had to be very careful about how we made uh, reactions take place in solution in the paint that occurred over the time scale of four to six hours. 
Because what we want to have happen is we want that to be irreversible. So there's three things that we added. So one thing that we added is we actually did cheat a little bit. So we added a little bit of organic material. So we have an interpenetrating network between a polymer, polyethylenamine, and the silica. So we put a compatibilizer, compa compatibilizer in there, which is part epoxy and part glass. It reacts with that polyethylenamine, forms a three-dimensional network, and then the silica interpenetrates in between all that. So that is really great for adhesion. It's really great for our tensile strength. It makes it act a little bit more like a regular polymer rather than, than glass. Uh, the other thing that we do that's really neat is we add cerium phosphate. And so cerium, people don't think about that uh, element very often. Cerium is actually a very interesting material for corrosion inhibition in aluminum. Uh, cerium 3 plus will form an insoluble precipitate with silica. And so once those two come into contact, no matter how much water you add, they won't redissolve. But what's re really neat about cerium is that cerium will actually then diffuse through your paint. And so if you had any corrosion in your aluminum, for example, this aluminum, uh, as it's corroding, gives off all these byproducts that are very oxidating, like uh, peroxides and so forth. And so in response to those peroxides, the cerium will actually deposit a, a, a layer of oxide directly on top of that corrosion to actually stop it. So it's, it's like basically specific to the corrosion. It's like a smart way of, uh, of, of stopping corrosion. But that also keeps us more water insoluble. And then the last thing is we use zinc oxide as our pigment. Zinc does the same thing. Zinc 2 plus will interact with the silicate uh, to make it insoluble. So with all those three things that we've added, uh, it, it's, it's really nice that you can paint it. You've got six hours to use it. But once that water evaporates, it's set and it's not going to redissolve. So does that mean it is, to an extent, self-repairing as well? Will it? Yes. It actually will just fill up, say, a scratch in your in your surface. Exactly. That that's the whole point of why we're taking this approach. Because uh, in 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 the coatings industry, some, sometimes they talk about these as uh, conversion coatings. Uh, so so chrome conversion coatings were things that were used for a long time, but they don't use them anymore because hexavalent chrome is is very toxic and there's a lot of bad side effects to it. So we're basically trying to replace a lot of those functions. And self healing is a great way to think about it because. Inorganic chemistry is kind of neat in that sense that it rearranges even at room temperature. Uh, like with a polymer, when you have a carbon-carbon bond, it's really hard to replace that once it's broken. But with SiO, you can actually have a lot of equilibrium between water and silica and cerium and, and, and ceria so, so that you're able to uh, kind of go back and forth a little bit. And we're mostly interested in naval applications, at least initially. And so we have lots of water available for doing all this chemistry. So moving on to the naval applications, there are very different challenges in the ocean than there are on an aluminium roof, for example. Is it comfortable with salt water, anti-fouling agents, all of the other things that, uh, that, mm -hmm. that naval environments project onto a surface? Uh, yes, and, and in fact, actually, cerium, uh, one of the neat things about cerium and zinc oxide, they're, they're both actually anti-fouling themselves as well, too. So they're, um, uh, they're almost like, uh, I guess, for microorganisms, they're, they're a little bit toxic, so, so they, don't, they don't like to adhere to those surfaces. Um, and so what we're actually trying to do is um, silica has a much higher operating temperature than most polymers. If you think about a polymer, uh, maybe 100 degrees Celsius is when it melts and maybe 200 is when it burns. Uh, silicates will go up to 760 degrees Celsius without burning. So in a lot of applications like exhaust stacks, um, uh, a lot of things on the tarmac, for example, on like, a, let's say, an aircraft carrier. High temperature is very important for some of these applications. And so the key for us as we transition from sort of a benchtop science research project to an actual product is we need to figure out how much of our paint is going to be the silica layer and how much is going to be in the top coat. Because there's mo almost certainly going to be some layer over the top of this. We, we think of this more almost like a primer than, than for a top coat for, for, for those applications. Um, but we think that those are solvable problems. But as far as like the hardness and everything else, I think our biggest challenge, I think, is going to be the brittleness. Glass is inherently brittle. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to hybridize that. Um, so, so if you think about silicone rubber, if you're familiar with like bathroom caulking, Silicone is SiOSI, that's the backbone, so that's the chemistry of that. Silica, same thing, SiOSI. So there's only like a very minor modification to get from silicone rubber to glass. And so what we're actually doing is chemically we're, we're hybridizing the two. And so we can actually blend it almost continuously from pure silicone all the way over to pure silica. And so the question is how far do we have to go 
before we get the right trade-off. Because if we go too far, then all of a sudden all these advantages I, advantages I talked about, like the high temperature stability and so on and so forth, we start to compromise those if we make it too much like silicone. But having that nice toughness and flexibility and so forth is a big advantage, especially if you're getting hit with a hammer or, or you know, uh, other types of impacts. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do you have any other questions? Yes. Oh, over here. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Uh, Bailo ACS News Service. Um, chromatographic uh, LC uh, useful materials are mostly silica, while well, there are some alumina, but they're, they're essentially derivatized with, uh, with organic uh, material, like usually methyl groups or, or some longer sure. uh, hydrocarbon, which basically is a surface thing. So is your your uh, glass coating uh, after you, you laid it out and dried it and so forth, is it a, a true glass or perhaps is it a microcrystalline thing? Uh, thing? And, and, uh, oh, you're asking if it's uh, amorphous or crystalline? Well, well basi basically. Now, the solution of sodium silicate is, is, is really a true solution of, uh, of, of, of silica and even without the alkali, silica is kind of soluble in, in, in water, just sure. any, any kind of water. Uh, that's probably where most of the, uh, most of the uh, petrified forests come from, uh, right. you, you know, getting impregnated with silica. But have you looked at this, at this part or, or have you considered laying down your, your silica glass on, on a piece of metal and then, then, then end, up, uh, end up derivatizing the surface, which is not a very difficult process, particularly since you're not looking for, for uniform little part, particles, you're looking for something that, uh, that is practical reflecting mm -hmm. surfaces. Yeah, well, we actually see that as, as a really big advantage. I mean, you know, initially we're, we're looking at, uh, for, for a very specific application. These are more like topside coatings for, for, sh for ships, right? So we're not even so interested in the hull. We're just mostly just the, the, the exposed part of the boat. Um, may, maybe roofing applications or automotive or, or uh, you know, aircraft as well somewhere down the road. But those, I think, would actually still be similar. But the types of things that you're talking about, I think, are very interesting when you start getting into th the ideas of multifunctional materials. And uh, the silane chemistry is, is absolutely a part of what we do. So um, when I talked in the previous answer, when I talked about trying to hybridize silicone and silica, that's precisely what we're doing. It's a dimethyl dimethoxysilane, which will basically form polydimethylsiloxane as, as that polymerizes in, in solution. Um, so you can think about a lot of very interesting biological applications if you, if you were to, say, pegylate your surface. Um, so you could do a, a lot of great surface chemistry because, a, as you know, with silane chemistry, all those different side groups that, that you have uh, give you a really broad range of really interesting things that you could do, um, especially at the interface, you know, that, that outer surface. So for the moment, we want to keep, I think, mostly silica exposed on the outer surface because that will be good for adhesion for whatever top coats we, we lay over the top. So for us, we're trying to stay away from that. But when silicates dry, there is some nanoporosity that, that's left behind. And in fact, there's a lot of bound water. So that intumescent property that I talked about before, what that actually is is boiling water. So when there's a fire, all that water, it's, it's, you know, we call it bound water because it's almost solid at that point. It's, it's so tightly bound to the silica, when you heat it up, that then wants to uh, boil. And it doesn't boil at 100 degrees Celsius. It's so tightly bound, it'll, it'll boil off at a much higher temperature. So what we have to worry about then is because we now have this nanoporosity, how do we control the behavior of, of water? Because now we're in a, in a naval environment. So we may actually be thinking about your, your sil silica, silicate derivatives in, in terms of the internal surfaces and trying to make maybe that a little bit more hydrophobic so that water doesn't pass through so quickly. So, so th those are some of the things that, that we're actually looking at in the future. Now, uh, for, the, for the moment, we seem like we're okay on that front, but I think we're at the stage of the project now where we've, we've solved most of the mechanical property issues. And so now we're actually turning our attention much more towards the corrosion aspects. So, you know, uh, the ingress of uh, chloride ions and, and so on and so forth could be very harmful. So how do we control that? And we may do so by basically looking at the surface, but thinking about it more like an internal surface through, through all that porosity. Now, we have a question. I have in one the... more question. Oh, sure. Uh, what took so long to get, get to this point with, with, with soluble silicates? Uh, 
When I was a little kid, we knew that uh, that water glass you can paint it on a piece of wood and it preserves it. And, and so, in fact, in fact, there was a process uh, uh, preserving wood for construction purposes, uh, right. where uh, jokingly we said, "Well, it it will break the uh, the termites' teeth when they start chewing it." Uh, that, I think that I can was, answer that. I, 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 yes. Yeah, so, so actually, so water glass paint is actually used a lot on concrete. So, so there, there is there is actually um, you know pretty good business to be had there. Um, but one of the things I think is uh, you know really limiting is it's it's a very brittle material, and and we've seen even you know for for commercial water glass paints that they, you really can't paint them more than uh, three thousandths of an inch. So that's about seventy five microns. Above that, you get this this thing called mud cracking. Um, as the water evaporates, the volume wants to contract, but it's already a solid. And so you build up all of these really high shear stresses within the paint, and silica being brittle and not really having such a great tensile strength will actually start to crack at that point. And so there's that issue. Um, a lot of times they have to be painted on roughened surfaces, and a lot of times they have to be painted on clean surfaces. So I think it really comes down to the engineering and the convenience of it. I think if people were willing to apply it the right way and have the surface all perfect, I think it probably would have more widespread adoption. But a lot of polymer paints are a lot more, I guess, robust in that sense that they don't really care. They're not very picky about what they what you paint them on. And I think that, and, and they're cheap too. So it, 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 you, you, even though silica has all these advantages that I'm working on. Uh, that, that's a big reason for this research is to actually solve those issues, try to make it more practical because when it's used, it's never going to be under ideal circumstances. So you, you have to engineer it so that no matter how you use it, you always get good results. And I, I think with silicates, it, it's more difficult than it is with polymer to achieve that. I think we have one question from the back. Yeah, we have an online question from Sophia Kai, ACS News Service. She's asking, what kinds of surfaces could this coating be used on? Just specific metals or others too? Right. So I would say probably all metals. So, so metals always have a, a native oxide layer on them. And so, you know, silicates are, are pretty good for forming bonds with, with a lot of different uh, metal oxides. And, you know, we're interested in aluminum. And so uh, if you're familiar with clay, uh, clay is actually an aluminosilicate. It's an A-L-O-S-I bond. So those form very readily. So that, that's the metal that we're working with. This would also work on steel, uh, so a lot of ferrous substrates. It'll, it'll work very well on concrete and any kind of inorganics as well. And, and for, for a lot of the reasons, when, when you see in nature a, a lot of earth uh, minerals having silica, silicon oxide bonding with all different types of uh, atoms, all of those are fair game. I think the pr place where we'll probably have the most difficulty is actually on top of other polymers. I think that we'll probably do fairly well on top of uh, certain types of epoxies that have amine groups uh, expressed on the surface. Maybe different types of uh, silicones might be also available. But I think in general, painting a, a silicate, especially a water-based silicate, over what's potentially a very hydrophobic polymer is going to be a challenge. Uh, so that's why I think we're probably looking at this as more of a primer that would, I think, be in direct contact with uh, a, a metal or a ceramic. And so then we, could you put this on bleachers, for, for instance, or uh, yes. slides? Out, outdoor structures, I think, is really what we're looking at. So. Uh, we, we really think you know vehicles are, are, are a really good uh, item because with vehicles you, you really want to protect what's underneath the paint. I mean that's that's the primary goal of paint. Uh, we, we think about uh, just appearance a lot of the times with paints, but in our case, we don't want to have to replace uh, your, your, your car or your airplane or, or your, your housing structures. Uh, of course, we're interested in Navy ships as our primary application. I think that's the biggest thing. I think things like bleachers and, and, and houses and commercial installations and stuff like that, I think, are, are also fair game as we move forward. I think we have a question here in the front. Yes. Jeff Hecht with uh, New Scientist magazine. I I've heard about glass coatings being use used on cars. We were offered one the last time we bought a car. Uh, what, how does this differ from that? And, you know, and what kind of you know, properties would, would, might this have if you were use if could it be adapted for using on cars? Well, I think they're probably all in the same family, as uh, I would say. And, and actually, you'll see a lot of uh, specialty paints being used on the exhaust or on the engine block. Um, there are also specialty paints being used on firearms and stovetops. So I think uh, even today, there are a lot of applications where you need to paint for a high temperature surface that, that comes into contact with a lot of heat. And those are usually in the silica family. So um, I talked about silicone, 
Uh, I talked about silica, and there's also another kind uh, called polysiloxane, which sometimes is a hybrid between, I, I would say it's a, somewhere between an epoxy and glass. Uh, and, and a lot of these are really based on this SIO, SI backbone. And uh, a lot of the properties that drew me to this particular class of materials, I think are also used in, in these automotive paints that, that you're referring to. So as far as what's different with ours, I think what I'm trying to do is I'm actually a, more of a polymer chemist uh, than an inorganic chemist. So when I look at silicon, I see four oxygens. I see a monomer with a functionality of four. And when I see... Uh, dimethyl dimethoxysilane, I see a monomer with a functionality of two. So I'm looking at this more like a three-dimensional cross-linked polymer. And so what I'm trying to bring to the table is a lot of the tricks that we've used in polymer chemistry, uh, controlling the molecular architecture of carbon-based polymers and applying those to silica to somehow get the best of both worlds. So I want to preserve all the great things about glass, all the great things about inorganic chemistry, but I want to add to that some of the convenience and robustness that you see in organic systems. Great, thanks. Um, I think that's all we have time for. Thank you so much, everyone. The archived version of this session will soon be posted at bit.ly slash ACS Live Boston. Please join us for our next press conference today at 1 p.m. on the latest in flexible electronics for monitoring health and for other applications. Thank you. <laughs>